Hi everybody, Tom Chapman here, and welcome back to my Map Tool tutorial series. Today we're going to be talking about tokens and token use in combat and some token options in there. Now, once we get into tokens, there's going to be a lot of talk about macros. Now, macros are going to come a lot later. They're those hot buttons that you've seen in the last uh, few videos where I can click on them and they roll an attack or they produce some sort of text or a random outcome or some something like that. So macros will be covered later. For right now, we're just going to get familiar with each token and what's involved in it. Now to start with, we're looking currently at my Crypt of the Everflame, the first floor, and I've got this room one full of skeletons. And we're going to deal mainly with this guy up here, the upper left hand skeleton. So first, as a review, when you click on a token, distance can be shown. So when I click on this token layer token, you can see that it shows how far these tokens move. For example, moving from here to here is 20 feet. Now at any point, you can also use spacebar to set a waypoint. So if we look right here, there's a column. Now I can't move through that column. I have to move around it. So I can move up one, hit spacebar, sets a waypoint, and then move here and then that makes it 10 feet. And you can set as many waypoints as you want for whatever quirky little movements your players or your NPCs may take. Now, when we actually get into the token, we can open it up and by just double clicking on it, or we can also get in there by right clicking and going down to edit. And there's a few things that we're gonna go through on this one. And we're gonna go through the tabs up at the top. First, when you get into a token, you can set its name. I like to name all of my tokens as enemy if they're fighting, uh, if the PCs are fighting it, because sometimes I just don't want them to know that the NPC has a name because they can find it by hovering over it. If there's something that I know that I want to be in this, then I put a GM name under here. So for example, name enemy, GM name skeleton. Let me click OK and I'll hover over it. So when I hover over the token, you see underneath it a name pops up, enemy, and then in parentheses, the word skeleton. The name enemy is what everybody would see if they hovered over it on a player screen. In parentheses is only the GM name. Open it back up. Up here, you can also set uh, what kind of token it is, NPC or PC. Now the notes section, it's really for you to use however you want. If it's up here in this notes section, Anybody who opens the token can see these notes. If it's in the GM notes, only the GM or someone assigned as a GM can see everything down here. And that's where I use to track HP and I put stat blocks down here so I have everything. And I've kind of been over this in other videos. Next, we have our properties tab. Now we're gonna discuss this more later, but just know that anything that's stored in the tokens under properties can be called on later, especially when using macros. So for example, in Pathfinder, if I had a strength of 15 for this skeleton, I could then use my macros to find out what is the strength, how does the strength affect an attack roll, and everything like that. Now there's more that we can come into with this later, but for right now, just know that this is what the properties tab is for. States. Now states are what you can apply to tokens to identify what's going on with them on the playing field. So any of these that you select in here, for example, if I selected dead and then hit OK, you'll see that this token now has a red X over it. And I can come on here and right click the same way and click clear state. And the same way on this, this is a shortcut, you can just click on things to say, all right, this guy's disabled. So it's got a gray X or you can say incapacitated, so now it has a red circle. And you can stack as many states on top as you want. I'm gonna click clear state. When I open it back up and come in here, there's also an option for health. Right now I have it clicked as hide, and this is one of those things where you can get as nitpicky as you want on this, it's just how much time do you wanna spend on it and how much information do you wanna to give to your players. So if I deselect hide, it's now visible. And this is given as a percentage scale from 0 to 100. When I click OK, if I look at this skeleton now, he's got a green health bar along the top. I'll open him back up and I'll adjust it. Let's say he's now at 50% health. I click OK and you can now see that the health bar is 50% gone on this guy. I'm going to open that back up. I don't want the health bar showing for right now. I've used it sometimes. Other times uh, it's just easier 
to not show it, especially for weaker enemies like skeletons. The speech tab is a great place where you can put in pre-typed out items for a token to say. So let's say, for example, they come in, the PCs come into this room, and they say, hey, this skeleton on the right, I'm going to ask him a question. And let's say, for example, they ask him, why are you guarding this place? I can select the token and come down here to the chat window and write forward slash T say, and I know I have a preset of two. So what this does is it goes to the token and it says, all right, in the speech window, what is ID two? And then it grabs that and it puts it into chat. The sound of bones clicking together is all you get as a response. You can put other things in the ID window, such as response, click OK, and then come down here and do T say response. Oops. T say capital R response. And there you go. Now that's kind of a nitpicky way of doing that. It just depends on how much you want to use the chat window, how much you want your players to read and everything like that. You can also right click on it and go to speech and also click on that as well. Let me try that again and hit response. And there you go. Now when I open this, the other cool thing about speech, if you ever want to use it, is you can assign die rolls as well. So let's say response one means I want to execute a 1d20 plus five roll. So doing the same thing, I can right click speech one and it comes up with that die roll. I can also come down here while the token selected, do T say one and it'll also give me that die roll too. Now this is kind of a long way to do macros, so it's up to you how much you want to use the speech. I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of the chat window, type forward slash CLR for clear, and it clears the entire chat window. And there's no getting it back, just so you know. And I'm gonna unpin it. Opening my skeleton back up, we're gonna go to ownership. Now, under ownership, once a game's going, is anybody that's logged into map tool, whether they're a GM or a player, will show up on this list here. So if you want everybody to be able to control this token, you just click all players. However, if you want strict ownership, let's say Bill and Ted are in here and Bill would be here and Ted would be here, you'd go, well, I want Bill to be able to control this. So you'd select Bill and make sure Ted's not there. And then only Bill can click on drag and interact with. Our last window configuration is a whole bunch of different things uh, that you can use depending on what you want to do with your game. Now, let's start with shape. Defaulted, I have this as top down. What that means when I click OK and I come up to my skeleton, I can click on it and hit shift and I can mouse wheel up or down. And that will rotate the skeleton 90 degrees. That's up and there's down. You can also do this where you select a token and hit control shift and when you mouse wheel up and down it rotates it less than 90 degrees. I'm not exactly sure what the rotation is. Uh, so that's only usable with top down. Let me change this to square which is the actual shape of my token. What that does is it adds a facing arrow. So when I click on the token and hit shift and mouse wheel up it points to which direction the token is facing and same with mouse wheeling down. Circle is the same thing, only it's just the shape of a circle for, for your token. Now figure gives a more 3D look to it. Still the same thing, it's got some facing on it and everything. That's if you're using isometric boards and uh, we can get into that more later. For right now, I'm gonna right click though and I'm gonna clear facing. I'm gonna make sure this is set on square. Now size. Size just means in like um, a 3.5 Pathfinder sort of thing, how many squares does the figure take up? Medium takes up one square, Colossal takes up way more, and now this is set to Colossal. Shortcut on that, you can just right click, go to size, and select your size there. And it goes all the way down to fine, which is still pretty big, but if it gets much smaller, then you won't be able to see the token. Change this guy back to medium and go back in. Now the properties drop down list, we'll get more into campaign properties later, but you can set up different campaign properties for different types of tokens. So you can have such things as a PC campaign property and an NPC campaign property. 
And what you would do is when you first create your token, you would come into properties or into the config menu and you'd select either, for example, your PC properties or MPC properties. I don't have those set up yet and we'll talk more about properties in a later video. Site, we talked about in the last video, how to assign site and how that works. So if you're curious about that, go ahead and check out the video number 16, vision and night and day and lighting. Now image table, you can hook up a token to an image table. Now this is a more advanced setting and something I'm unfamiliar with. So maybe at a later date, I'll come back and deal with this. But for right now, I don't use this in my games and uh, it's up to you if you want to use that or not. Over here, we have some other options, snap to grid, visible to players and visible to owners only. I like my tokens to snap to grid. So what that means is when I move them, no matter what, they're going to snap to the middle of each grid square. If I deselect that, then when I click and drag them, they don't snap. They just kind of go anywhere. It depends on what kind of game you're using. If your game has a lot of tactical movement in it, you'll really want to select snap to grid. If not, and you just want to show general motion, then you can leave snap to grid unselected. And if you look, I can also set waypoints without it set to snap to grid, and it does that as well. When it's not on snap to grid, you can also see the distance that tokens are moving. If you look right underneath the token I'm moving, I'm currently at 44.5 feet in the game. Now you can also right click and click on snap to grid, and that'll do the same thing. And right clicking and then unselecting it would make it not snap to grid. Other things in Snap to Grid, visible to players. Right now, this is not visible to players, so when they first come into room one, they can't see this skeleton, but if I select it, then they can. And this one, visible to owners only, so this would only make it visible to anybody that you've selected under the ownership tab. And that's up to you how you want to use that. The last part of the config tab and the edit token options is what you see when you hover over or right click on a token. So currently layout is just basically what you see when you look at the token. That is the image the token defaults to when you see it on the map. Portrait is what happens when you hover over the token. So for example, this token I've hovered over, no portrait shows up in the lower left hand side of the screen. When I come over to this one though, it has a portrait assigned and you see its portrait down in the lower left. This is visible both on the GM side and the player side, but only when that specific computer hovers over for the image. So if you have a token that's not very easy to see and you want a better image, then you can put it on the portrait section and it'll show up down here in the lower left. Handout is the last thing that we have here, and I've used this a few times, in, uh, and this is what I did with stat blocks is, until I started putting stat blocks under notes. So in config, I put a handout down here that I screenshotted from, a, uh, from the module that I use this from, and so that means when I come up here, right click, and go to show handout right here, it'll pop this up in the middle and you can click it, drag it, left button to move, right button to drag to resize to make it bigger. And if you want to, that just pops up and you can X out of it if you don't want to see it anymore. Now you can do all sorts of handouts in there. You can have specific instructions for each of these. You can use it for whatever you want, but again, just right click and go to show handout. Now one issue with, uh, with map tool is to be very careful when you want to mark something as dead. The number of times I've clicked on a token and hit the delete button, which brings up this, and gone yes, and then that token is gone forever. And I've done that a number of times. There is no undo when you do that other than reloading the campaign from the last save. When a creature dies or you want to remove it from the board, you should just move it out of the way because if it has treasure, such as I have noted down here, gear, broken chain shirt, broken scimitar, you want to be able to get back into that without having to look it up in the original PDF or the handout or anything like that. So really, I make use of states as often as I can. And again, you can just right click and go down here and set states this way. Now map tool comes with these states that you see here preloaded. In a, in a video, a few videos down the road, I'll show you how to make your own custom states. So for example, when I was running a water campaign and the characters fought underwater a lot, 
I had to show how not only how far they were on the X and Y axis, but I also had to show how far underwater tokens were and how far up into the water they were. So I kind of had to make my own states for that as well, and I used that to help players figure out how far they'd have to swim to attack. So again, we'll go over how to make your own custom states later on in a future video. Now a few things. Um, you can kind of click on these and a lot of stuff that we talked about when you double clicked on the token you can do here. So we've already gone over setting facing, clearing facing, uh, size, speech, state, uh, bar. If you want to show health, there's also other bars that you can have on there. So if you have a mana system or let's say in Numenera, you want your PCs to be able to track their three main stats that they spend, you can do that there. Initiative, which we can go over later and all sorts of other things. Flipping, you can just, um, like, I want to flip this horizontally. There you go, if you need to do that. Um, halos are great because, let's say, for example, as you see, in this room, we've got six skeletons, and you're like, okay, we're having trouble telling these six skeletons apart because this battle's lasting so long. I'm going to go down to Halo, and I'll just say, all right, you're attacking the skeleton with the Aqua Halo. And that helps distinguish these apart from each other. I've used halos quite a lot when I play these games. Arrange. This is, if we haven't gone over it in the past, this is how things would look if you stacked them on top of each other. So I've got this one. I'm going to click arrange, send to back. And that way, when he overlaps with this token, the token that's looking to the left that doesn't have aqua is the one that would go on top, no matter what. That's what that does. It just depends on how you're um, layering your tokens or any other uh, image on a layer. Change to, this one's convenient. Uh, let's say, for example, you've just put down an information token on the hidden layer, and then you drop in an image token or an NPC token, and you went, oh, I put it on the hidden layer. Rather than deleting it and then reapplying it on the token layer up here, you can just right click it and you can change it to any layer you want. So put that on hidden, and now it's a hidden token. But if you do that and you need to change it back, you have to go to the new, um, the new layer that you put it on and send it back to the original layer. Again, we've done light source, uh, show path. That kind of just depends on, that's where its last path that it just took is. Visible to players, just shortcut there. Cut, copy, delete, revert last move, edit, and my favorite, save. If you have a token that keeps coming up over and over again that you want to save, you can click save, and it opens up a save menu like this. And you can name the token, and then uh, you can just click and drag it from your file explorer onto the map you're using. And that's a little quick one. I do that a lot with uh, Numenera tokens because they're a little harder to copy. So I have a whole bunch that I've extracted after I've finished them, and I have them in a file folder. One last item, this token is set as an NPC with no vision, and if I come down here to expose, it can't expose anything. And I misspoke earlier, I should mention this. Uh, NPC tokens can expose um, unrevealed areas, but they have to have sight first. So what we're going to do is I'm going to double click on this, and I'm going to come up here to has sight, and we'll just leave it as normal. Now, when I right click and come down here, expose is there and it'll give you um, some options on how to do this. So if you moved a token and you want, and you say, oh, I wanna reveal everything they just saw when I moved, it'll reveal the last path. Uh, I use Control I all the time to reveal that and only currently visible, which is from where the token is. So that's about it for tokens for right now. Uh, we're gonna go over more on how to use all those different things like how to set up your own to token uh, properties, how to create your own states, how to make different bars, and also how to start doing macros on specific tokens later on in future videos. But that's just an overview of everything that's involved in the token and some basics on what you need. So that's it for now, and we'll see you in the next video. Thanks.